All right, I'll go ahead. All righty. So yes, thank you so much. I um, am so in, incredibly honored to be um, to have a hoodie with Endo Mentor on it. So thank you so much for this opportunity. We really just don't consider the importance, I think, of radiology um, on a daily basis. Uh, when Jabber and I were speaking about topics, obviously, I think most everyone knows that my true, true passion, aside from endodontics, is dental trauma. So I wasn't terribly thrilled about um, speaking about radiology. But as I've um, begun assembling this presentation along with others on 2D as well as 3D, it really has given me a lot of insight into the limitations that we have with 2D. And I hope to give you guys some pro tips today to really make the information that you gather from your 2D films um, better, um, as well as some tips on how you take the uh, periapicals, bite wings, whatever. And then I do wanna share with you some 3D cases at the very end, um, again, because our, uh, our audience predominantly is um, limited in their comb beam opportunities. Um, because the 3D has totally been a humbling and learning experience. I've really uh, dedicated the, the past two years in COVID to becoming better in 3D. And I can say that it's really opened my eyes um, to everything, as well as the way I treat patients or treatment plan, what I'm offering when people come to me for um, a consultation. So without further ado, I'm not advancing. Hmm. Oh my goodness. What's the problem? There we are. Okay. So I'm I'm I, I love this film because this is Dr. Kazi's film that he sent me. Uh no, I didn't I, this is not an opportunity. Like this is all good, guys. So this is a PSP plate, clearly. This was his case from earlier this week. Um he and I enjoy you know, back and forth inter exchange of, of um, collegial opportunities. So obviously this tooth needed endo, there's a large amount of decay. You can see that the PSP plate is, uh, you know, has been well loved, let's call that. But the thing that I do when I look at 2D is first and foremost, I try to play with it um, and see exactly what I'm looking at. So I, here I see the sinus, I see the zygoma, I see a wisdom tooth, obviously all of these teeth. And then what I really do, because I'm an endodontist, is I start tracing the PDLs. And I really try to make sure that I can see the lamina dura surrounded by a white line. And then I try and I squint and I somewhat hallucinate and try to figure out if I am interpreting it correctly. So, here again i'm picking up the black line with the white bone and it's it should be an intimate relationship you should have intimacy between that pdl and the lamina dura to the root um, what i also try to appreciate always is again the dentition carries anything like that restorations but also the bone so i'm looking always at the bone levels and you can see here that the horizontal bone there is some horizontal bone here, but the density, see that density decrease? So probably what is happening here, and I actually haven't talked to Jabber about this case, but what's probably happening here is that there's caries, there's been a lot of food impaction, and there may be a lot of uh, initial bony changes on this film, but you always wanna be tracing that horizontal bone because as we're seeing more and more heavily restored teeth, older patients, there's a lot of angular defects that you can pick up on when you trace the PDLs, when you look at the horizontal bone loss. And those angular defects, if you pick them up on 2D, it's an entirely additional conversation um, to be having with your patients. So back to this tooth. Um, again, I'm tracing the PDL here. And I would call this widened PDL, right? The black is a little bit thicker shadowing 
Um, and then I pick up the distal buccal root and I would say it's maybe even a little bit of shadowed there. I, again, didn't ask Jebber what the pulp status was of this tooth. He literally just sent me the PAs. But then what's really, really tricky about this case is the palatal, like, right? Like we don't really see where it is. And I think I see what is like a fat sausage pulpal um, canal here. So uh, uh, I don't know the age of the patient, but if the age is correct, I have to begin to suspect the apical development of this root as well. So when I trace it, Initially on this film, I would say it's probably here, but this is where I start playing with my tools. And again, just really quickly, this um, uh, upper left seven, again, I would call that white in PDL. Um, the distal buccal root might come up here and the palatal might be right here. But that's my point, right? We're, it's very difficult. We're squinting, we're guessing, we're really not sure. So immediately when Jabber sent me this, I started playing with it. I uploaded it to my um, FMX. So you're gonna see my FMX in the back here, but I immediately lightened it. So on most of your radiology softwares, when you drag the cursor across the film, up or down, left or right, you can really change the shades of gray that you can see. So again, now, you know, this is a lighter film, right? This was Jabber's original film, and this is now lighter. And again, I think we are right there now that it's lighter. And if I add Clearview, it's one of the um, tools on my software, then it immediately sharpens the entire film, which is uh, a lot what a lot of the US dentists prefer. They prefer to view all films on Clearview. So that's one of the tools, but you can also appreciate some of my other tools that are here. Um, the other thing that I'm always looking at is to make sure that these pulp spaces are uniform. So I'm always looking to see that the amount of gray within the canal space is relatively the same. When this, we can appreciate, is a little bit more shrunken than its counterpart, right, or neighbors, Obviously, that makes sense because Carrie's has been sitting on top of this pulp or nearby for probably a, a, quite a while. And so the pulp is going to react. That tertiary dentin is going to be laid down. So then my one of my favorite tools is invert. So I immediately will invert after I've gotten the image to where I like. And then you can really, some of these laminaduras and PDLs really pop out at you when you invert. And again, I'm kind of maintaining that that is where the true PDL is. And then my next favorite tool is relief, which kind of um, adds a layer of embossing on the film. That I feel helps kind of pop out different densities of the bone as well as what we suspected was a widened PDL or possible periapical lucency or start of a periapical lucency here on the distal buccal root. Um, you know, it really pops out at you here when you do the relief tool. And I, um, on some of the softwares, it is called emboss or, or just has another name for it. So without further ado, I did wanna just share some films and how not only you can interpret what you're looking at, but improve upon. So I was emailed these films and I, I do apologize. I tried to get rid of most of the US teeth numbers, but you can clearly all appreciate it that this is the upper left quadrant. But this film is severely angled, right? Like where does that mesial buckle end? Does it end right here? Does it end like a little further? Where's that distal buckle? I really can't trace any PDLs. This could be long on the palatal. It, there could be a periapical lucency. I am suspicious, but it's so foreshortened, I just can't tell. And to be honest, I can't really even tell the bone, right? I can't tell. There might be an angular defect here, but there's just so much foreshortening. Either the dentist or the nurse, the assistant, tried to realize this and tried to take a better film, but still, this isn't that much better. You can see that with less foreshortening, that looks on the palatal less long. But again, the, maxillar, the maxillary teeth, especially the posterior maxillary teeth, are just so difficult 
because of all of the sinus superimposition. And obviously the denser the bone you have, it's even harder to appreciate. So some tips I really do want to talk about soon is um, how to get these films better. Same thing, um, if this patient is being referred for either of these molars, um, it's going to be really difficult. We see maybe widened PDL here, maybe even a periapical lucency, but we can't, again, appreciate anything on this palatal root. And this tooth, you can see, has a more shrunken pulp space. I'm always looking at the pulp spaces. And again, maybe there's a root, maybe there's a second root, right? We are always suspicious of MB2's pr presence tracing the PDLs here and the palatal root. Something might be going on with the premolar. We're tracing the PDLs. And again, if I had my, if this was in my software, I'd be changing the density by scrolling the mouse. I would have inverted, I would have embossed. When you change the densities of your film, so you're gonna see that horizontal bone pop out, but you're also gonna be able to show um, your patients where the gingiva is. So sometimes you'll really see a light, light, light gray that pops out right here so that when you're explaining, for example, crown lengthening, it helps because they don't understand on the x-ray that their gingiva is right here. And then the foundation of the tooth has to be dropped. So it can be helpful when they can appreciate that. Um, because for the most part, this is hard for patients to understand what you're trying to show them. So same thing on this tooth, the, this is, um, these teeth, excuse me, this was a film that I was uh, given. I always ask for a referring dentist to send me a pre-op just so I know what I'm dealing with and maybe I can gather and uh, gleam a little bit of more information before the patient comes in so I can be pre better prepared. I really, really love being um, prepared. So again, with the <laughs> jabber nose. <laughs> um, so again, with this horizontal bone loss, you can really appreciate that solid density here. But if you can pick up on this nuance, you see the horizontal bone here, but see how it's not as dense as it is here? There is an angular defect here, right? And then also it, it um, comes up. And here is that gingiva that I was speaking of when you change the densities. But this patient was referred for this tooth. And what can't I see? The most important part for an endodontist, which is the root tips, right? So um, it's always so fascinating to me how, you know, obviously dentists can be suspicious of a tooth, but if they're going to take a film, be sure to actually capture what you want to look at because we know it's tricky. We know patients will resist. We know but when you're trying to gather all of the information, it, it is super important just to try to what um, my assistant who is amazing and I do is we try to make sure that that cone head is literally um, going to capture that tooth. We look in the mouth, we look at the cone head, we pretend we are, our eyes are the cone head and that uh, those x-rays are going exactly through the tooth so that there's also not any overlap as well. And also, um, especially when the, there are canines, right, and it's so difficult, like imagine where the root apices are so that that cone head can capture the root apices as well. Also on this film, I think it's super important to share, look at this ginormous pulp space, and then this is its neighbor, and there's an angular defect. There's no restorations on this, so why is this pulp so shrunken? That gives me a light bulb. This tells me something is happening here. You can appreciate maybe that this cusp is flatter. Um, there Maybe there's a PFM opposing it or a, uh, or a porcelain crown opposing it, but this tooth surely is getting some insults from somewhere, um, and that is why this pulp is so much more narrow than its neighbor. Similarly, you can barely see these pulp canal spaces. They're there, but you really can't appreciate them. And it, definitely um, they are lost here you, where you maybe, maybe see something right there. And then I really can't appreciate anything else. Maybe there's a small chamber here. And again, this one's slightly foreshortened also. 
Um, this one's severely foreshortened. Again, I can't even see the buccal roots on this um, tooth. So just make sure that the foreshortened um, x-rays that you might develop or capture are uh, retaken. And usually sometimes, you know, for example, last week, my assistant had to really have a nice conversation. It's always a pleasant conversation, but listen, we just want to capture this and we want to get the information so that we don't have to do it again because the nurses, the assistants, the patients really hate being there capturing the same film three times. It really loses the um, confidence of the patient in the practitioner, the office. Um, one of my neighbors complained to me one time that their dentist like took, you know, had to take a film four times. In my office, if um, my assistant doesn't capture, and this has always been the rule, doesn't capture what we need by the second or third film, they're to come get me. And I know internationally, because we had so many lovely conversations, that internationally, you, it's the dentists capturing these films. But here in the US, if um, the whoever it doesn't capture, even even me, I would probably ask Marina, just get a different set of eyes to look at the, um, because something's not not um, working out and you don't wanna just sit there and expose 11 times. So this is another thing that we commonly see uh, when we get films. And I really kind of wanted to spend a lot of time on this. So as an endodontist, right, I'm immediately drawn to this tooth. There's a, a root canal that's kind of, um, let's just say different looking, unique looking. <laughs> yes, um, the gutta percha isn't supposed to squiggle like that for sure. And thankfully, despite the maxillary sinus superimposition, we can appreciate that there's a periapical lucency, right? Maybe this is MB and MB2 or vice versa. Maybe this is palatal and this is distobuccal. Surely we can appreciate that this is the palatal root. We trace it. We get this periapical lucency, um, and that's about it. Why? Because this is so severely overlapped. What happened here was that the cone was too mesial, and it's just tooth on top of tooth on top of tooth. We can't appreciate context, but despite wanting to focus in on this tooth, there's still so much other information here, and I want to go over that. So one, yes, this is a heavily restored tooth. But the pulp here, pulp chamber, is very shrunken. I would expect that this tooth would have a larger pulp chamber despite just this MOD amalgam restoration. And thankfully, right, clinically we put this all together, right, because it's not just the radiology. It's the radiology with the clinical presentation and then also my pulp vitality tests. So when this patient came in, what we can appreciate but could be easily missed, especially with this overlap, is that there's a large amount of decay here with maybe a void or a broken restoration in this resin. And what I expect are two pulp chambers with two beautifully tracing skinny roots, right? Everyone can see those PDLs. And then on this tooth, what's really exciting is the two pulp chambers, right? One, two, but what we see here is the divergent split of the pulp chamber. So this is a three-canaled premolar. I am suspicious that this is a three-canaled premolar. And thankfully, I took a comb beam. I was able to take a comb beam, and I was right. Um, these patients are, he came for this tooth. I treated this tooth because I also saw this on the pre-op when the referring dentist sent him over, I wanted to take a scan, I took a scan. These patients, when they're asymptomatic, are very dubious of your interpretation, that, the, that they need retreatment, that there's something wrong. And when you take a comb beam and you show them the void of bone inside the 3D um, scan, it really does help chat with and have a conversation and educate your patients. Um, light bulb moment, you know, and not always do they book, not always, especially when they're asymptomatic, but at least they're aware, you know, then the, the 
then the conversation, at least here in the U.S., is, okay, maybe I'll plan for that next year when my benefits renew, or maybe I'll plan for that. I'll be more aware of it. I'll put it on my list of things to do. So it's definitely helpful. All right, so again, this tooth, um, this patient was sent for this lower molar. Um, you can see I'm looking at the horizontal bone, which looks amazing on this um, case. The pulp chambers look pretty uniform. Here I would say they're a little shrunken, but that makes sense. This is a large restoration. The cusps are flat, the cusps are flat, but again, I can't see what I really want to look at, so I have to take a new film here anyways or a scan. This um, was exactly the patient that I was just have been hinting at this whole time. She was referred for tooth number, um, let me do this really quickly, lower left seven. So this tooth, <laughs> there's really nothing here I can appreciate, right? Uh, not only is this film terribly grainy for, for me, um, I can still in do interpretation on this, of course. We can see pulp chambers here, probably one. We can trace beautiful PDLs here. There's probably the mental for Amen here. So see how that density changes? That's where I'm like, I'm looking and it's almost like I'm swimming through all of the shades of gray. I'm swimming through that entire mandibles levels because they're, they've all been sandwiched onto that 2D film, if that makes sense. So here again, um, I'm tracing the PDL. And that looks beautiful. And again, all of the pulp canal chambers look relatively the same, except when we get to her lower molars, right? Which makes sense because they're more restored. So there's small, small, small shrunken pulp chamber, small canals. I see a hint of something here, but really like just a hint. Um, you're really trying to stretch to find. So um, my assistant, knew she was tough because she had tried to put in the sensor. We didn't get any heads up that she was tough, but obviously like if they're sending this and this is all they got, and we, we got two images that were pretty much the same looking like this. She had a conversation with her. She was very kind. She was very patient, but it really was a conversation saying like, let's just do this once and then we won't have to bother you and poke and prod. So this is the film she got. Isn't this amazing? It's the same patient. And what, it really doesn't. You'd think I did it like a bait and switch on you guys, right? But it's the same tooth, I can assure you. So again, the horizontal bone, I would, I, I'm a little suspicious here, but not nothing. See, the, the horizontal bone should really be going like edge to edge. There should be no dips, right? So here it dips a little bit. And here it, it is straight across on one side. But if you can squint and appreciate the change in density, it does dip a little here. And then here you can see the big dip, right? So there's horizontal bone either on the buccal or the lingual, but then definitely changes and there is an angular defect here. What you can also try to appreciate, um, beautiful PDLs, beautiful PDLs. I can trace everything. Nothing really um, jumps out at me until I start to trace here. Maybe it's widened, maybe not, but this type of, canal configuration, especially on a second molar, has me suspicious of a C-shaped canal. And this actually was a C-shaped canal. The other thing that you can really start to appreciate and what I always love to share with dentists is there's a pulp stone in here. There's quite a big pulp stone in here. I don't know if you guys can see that. But when you see pulp stones in pulp chambers, that means that the pulp is inflamed. And what I really, really love to share with dentists, especially when you see shrunken pulp chambers, and not just to dentists, but empowering your team, hygiene, assistants, when they see patients with shrunken pulp chambers, um, stones uh, in their pulp chambers, or heaven forbid, no pulp chamber at all, one, be suspicious, maybe empower your team to take proactive PAs maybe a little bit more regularly than they normally would, but also where I really get to begging and whining with uh, dental teams is um, if you see any pulpal changes that, are, that stand out compared to their neighbors 
or stand out from year to year or from year to the last x-ray from um, when you last had their, that film on that tooth. If you're planning to change the restoration, please, please, pretty please, take a PA at least. Um, you'd be surprised how many people replace MODs or crowns without new films, new PAs, and often they're necrotic already or they're irreversible and you're touching the tooth, you're changing that last restoration is the last straw and the patients, when they need a root canal, they, they blame you, that's right, they blame you, they come to us and Adonis upset, um, you were the last person to touch them, you didn't say anything to them, so I had a, um, an amazing group of dentists that I spoke with last weekend, and really what I want, what I, it was a great conversation to share with everyone, when you have a deep restoration, when you're going to change the restoration and it's close to the pulp, remember that pulp is 3D. So when you're getting three millimeters close to the pulp, you really should be telling the patient and having that, like laying down that foundation that, listen, this is getting to be, a, you know, large and, and your nerve is a very delicate tissue and we're encroaching upon it. So please, if you have any symptoms, let me know. I just want to let you know you might end up having a root canal. Honestly, they do so much better when you have that initial conversation rather than no conversation at all. Then they become symptomatic or in extreme pain. And then they're shuttled off to an endodontist or you do the root canal. They just don't feel as good. That Their spirit is broken. They're upset. They're annoyed usually because they have symptoms. So it really just does help set everybody's expectations properly when you just caution them that this might. I don't know how this is going to end up, but this might. And obviously, if you're super, super close, offer them a prophylactic endo. I, I would have never thought I believed in prophylactic endo, but I really have gotten to the point in my career where I do. There's a time and a place for it because the last thing that the patient wants, that you want, that the endodontist wants is to drill through this, gosh darn it, beautiful porcelain crown, right? Look at these margins. This is spot on. This is a beautiful crown. I would, I would tell me. A nightmare to get through. It might shatter depending on how the porcelain was laid. Um, the patient just paid for a lot of money for this and it, it just doesn't sit well with anyone. Um, so it never hurts to offer it. I would say when you offer, 80% of patients decline. But at least you've kind of checked the box that you've informed them, you've given them the option. If something, what? Yeah, you've covered your bases. I was going to say something different, but yeah, you've covered your bases. Absolutely. So a few pro tips moving on. Um, I want to go over the tongue, the cotton rolls, eyeballing um, canines, and then adding supplements to your armamentarium. So you can see he better, better 2D images. Yep. So here um, in the United States, it's very common for most dental offices now to have sensors. These sensors are thick. Um, Tori don't like them, <laughs> and small mouths don't like them. But um, all of this is what I use. So a few things. If we're capturing the lower molars, we ask the patient to put their tongue up. So then we slide that sensor in between their teeth and their tongue, and then the patient is not fighting but uh, like their tongue is, is a strong muscle and they will fight pushing this sensor out. So when we ask for them to put the tip of your tongue to the roof of your mouth, please, we take that opportunity to just sneak right in there in between their teeth. And then we ask them to lower their tongue. And at that point, they're closing down their mouth. And sometimes also I'll put a cotton roll right here and that forces the maxilla to then further push that sensor down a little bit deeper. So that's one thing that I do for longer roots or when the patient really isn't um, cooperating with biting down fully. So that's one thing that we use, um, but it's super helpful. And of course you can do this with PSP also, which is even more tolerable, but um, 
yeah, just asking them to raise their tip of their tongue to the roof of their mouth is super helpful to sneak on in there and get those better lower um, molars. We also, so thin, so thin. I mean, PSP is good, um, but yeah, they get abused and they need to be uh, replaced, you know, after lots of love. So definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a wand uh, that I have. So it's soft sided and rubber. It fits most sensor sizes. We just sneak that in um, and that kind of cushions the plastic edges as well as the sensor edges so the patient can hold this wand. Um, of course, there's other wands that we uh, use. And also like even for bite wings, sometimes they're not gonna cooperate. I have those bite wing tab stickers that I use. Um, do whatever you need to do, but get a good image. It's going to be so valuable in the long run for your diagnosis. Um, here's, again, some, some other films that I wanted to share with you. You know, this is a very curious film because this is a virgin canine, but you can see there's clearly a lucency. When this comes out, right, because surely you weren't expecting it. So number one, we need to go higher to the tip of that root, but also I want the entire lesion captured. I want to know what we're dealing with, right? Um, some other things because I want to just go through this film with you. So I am just checking. This looks like there was probably an extracted premolar the way that this is canted mesially. And as well, this is dome shaped with a, quite a large embrasure. So I'm suspicious that there was a, 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 either a serial extraction here or a premature extraction and this tooth is mesially canted. Um, here, this could be a cingulum, but being that I'm responsible for resorption, um, detecting resorption as well, or being suspicious a, and a, hopefully a, capturing early resorption, I would definitely want to look at this clinically as well as this. This is more consistent with the cingulum because we see this here, um, but all of these shades along the root is, uh, are places that I would make note to monitor. So again, this um, is, trying to show how I capture her canine. To be very honest, I might have even gone a little higher or on her forehead or around her temple even. So I'm looking to make sure that this cone head is exactly lined up with capturing parallel to the sensor. So I am looking back and forth between my cone head and my sensor to make sure that I'm lined up. It, will surprise you every time you take a, an x-ray of a canine how high up you have to be. It's almost like you're taking a brain shot, um, but you're not, it, it will capture the canine. Oh, just for, hip, for HIPAA, no. I mean, yes, we do use sunglasses. You can see them right here. We use sunglasses for all of our patients, um, usually because my microscope light as well as my loops light is super bright. So we use um, tinted sunglasses and eye protection for every patient, um, but I just blocked her eyes out with for HIPAA. This is a standard practice here in the US. <laughs> all right. So the other thing that you can do, especially when the rubber dam is on, and obviously this doesn't show the rubber dam on, but you can ask the patient to hold their finger. Um, remember when the rubber dam is on, sometimes it's very tenuous in terms of the clamp not wanting to move and it's a small mouth and there's the frame and there's the dam and there's the clamp. So oftentimes we'll have the patient hold the sensor where the root apices are and all I want is the root apices. I don't even care about capturing anything else but this just goes to, sh this, these, this set of slides shows how um, you can have the patient hold the sensor or the PSP plate for you. Again, when you're having a patient hold a PSP plate, it's gonna round because the PSP plate is so um, flimsy and flexible. Um, flexible. Um, so, you know, just try to make sure that it's really a parallel film rather than a, a tented film with your PSP plate. So, thanks. 
Um, so this is another case that was referred uh, for the upper molars, upper left molars. And again, I can't see anything here. What I can appreciate is that this pulp chamber is quite large. This pulp chamber is quite shrunken for whatever reason. I don't see any restoration. And what I also see here, and this is where the shades of gray and all of those tools come in, is this is not the start of external invasive cervical root resorption. This is level three. This is extensive root resorption that has encompassed nearly the entire pulp chamber at this point. And this was actually the tooth in question when the patient came. Um, they, they were referred for this, these, but really it was, it turned out to be this, um, too. Yeah. And this is what, this is advanced, right? Like this is, this is a lot of structural loss already. So you can appreciate how you really do have to stare at these films, play with the tools, really squint and kind of swim through all these shades of gray that you're looking at. Um, because this is easy to miss, especially when you, you, you know, you're slammed, you have a lot of films you're looking at, you're in between patients. Burnout. Yep. 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 And remember with resorption, these cases are like, will test vital. So they'll stump you. This will test vital. The pulp is fine here. It's that the root structure is damaged. So this technically is often asymptomatic. They did, they were complaining about some vague pain, but this tooth you had to really, really stare at and really had to work up well with your pulp vitality test to really capture this. And, and of course, this is very well captured on comb beam as well. Um, I did, I did. Um, so I have a few that I can highlight on, uh, I can direct later on Insta that case and others um, with resorption. I try to s s on Insta every, you know, few months or so, scroll through a case and narrate and see what I'm looking at and why or how my thought it, thoughts in terms of a treatment plan changed when I'm looking at a scan. So they're under the comb beam highlights on my Insta page. You can look through. There's some that were are older that I took with my phone, but now I'm trying to capture them um, with video recording software so that you guys really get the quality better. So here's where cone cuts are allowed, right? So this was my trial, I call it a trial pack film. I was doing endo, uh, the, you know, patient the patient has a rubber on. dam on, has a clamp on, and really all I care about is that making sure that my lengths are good and I wanna move I on. I am not, ha I'm not retaking this film and I'm definitely not asking uh, my to assistant to retake this, this film. This captures all of the information that I need yeah. and, we're and we're moving on. So this was an interesting case that was referred to me. Again, you can see that it's not my sensor. This is that same grainy um, sensor that uh, that I think um, the same office from one of the prior slides showed. But they, the dentist actually didn't know what they were looking at. So they referred the patient to me. The patient was asymptomatic. But you can see here, again, the zygoma, the sinus. Um, there's a good pulp chamber here shrunken pulp chamber here, right? Um, larger restoration, so that makes sense. Um, I can kind of see bone. There's a lot of angulation here. And this tooth is clearly rotated, right? Because it's, we can see almost all of the side of the tooth, whereas the, these, even though they're angulated, we see most of the tooth straight on. But the dentist didn't know what we were looking, what they were looking at. So they thought it was curious and they sent the patient to me for a consultation. And the patient. Again, the patient was asymptomatic. So what you can see on this tooth, I hope we all can appreciate, PFM crown, PFM crown yeah. definitely a post, definitely some sort of root canal material. And as we trace the PDL, we do see a PDL here. We do see a PDL here. And we pick them both back up here and here. But if we take a look back, right, and try to do a where's Waldo on here. 
we can see that this little area has a slightly lower density of bone, right? Or increased gray. Yeah, definitely. Does that, right? So what the dentist didn't realize was that these are two retrofills and this was an untreated canal. So the story begins to, to unravel and, and develop, right? So this is the history on that tooth. Now, some patients will remember the history, some patients won't. But this tells us a story. There was a root canal, there was a post and a core, and excuse me, crown. And then at some later point, there was an apico. The practitioner captured the apico retrofill on both roots, but there's still a missed canal here yeah. and there's still an infection. So we did take a scan on this patient and it showed exactly that. Um, but this sensor you can appreciate and this film would be hard to interpret just on 2D alone, especially if you don't if you're not anticipating, right, the story about the apico and the retro. Yeah, the only kind of indication is that canal that we can see is very much off center. Exactly. So imagine if this tooth wasn't rotated, we'd never know. And again, kudos to that practitioner for capturing both of these um, canals when they did the surgery. Sometimes they'll remember when they had the surgery or who, you know, who did the surgery. Sometimes it's a nearby practitioner. Sometimes I can get the chart notes. Um, but really, like, that's me that that practitioner got it with, uh, you know, without a scan likely at the time. Um, but yeah, so this tooth is probably failing because of this untreated canal. Okay. So I love this case for so many reasons. Number one, um, it was a very kind patient, but this gave me probably the largest dose of humble pie in my entire career. So what you can see on this film is this is a younger patient. I'm just going to tell you that right now, but there's a good amount of horizontal bone, right? There's a lot of restorations. And this is a, remember, this is a, a mid young twenties patient, right? Um, what I see here is maybe a funky, like what is, I don't know what is going on here. This may be a lateral canal here. I, I, I just don't really know. Um, here I can trace the PDL. I can trace the PDL. I can trace the PDL. It's a DO restoration. The pulp seems chamber good. seems good. The sinus, the sinus, and then very much widened pair um, PDLs all around the palatal roots on both of these molars, as well as the buckle roots on the uh, the first yeah. molar. So, so if, if deep, I trace the PDL here. So it kind of makes sense. Yeah, exactly. It makes sense, right? So hopefully this practitioner okay. had that, you know, like, hey, this was a really deep conversation. This was a really deep restoration conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. What I also should have truly. truly been more keen on was this root canal, right? So these are large, large shapes. Remember, this patient is young to mid 20s. This is a crown. This is a lot of restorations for such a young patient who relatively has a well maintained, clean mouth. So, what I really should have been keen to pick up on is that this palatal was probably short, right? We can say short and also just very, very wide and dense. This looks like a highway basically, yeah. right? So I went into this tooth and what I, sh I did not take a comb beam at that time. And this tooth had a wide open apex. Now I can go back and think about everything that I'm going through, right? In real time with the patient um, underneath me. And what hap probably happened was that all of these restorations were placed when she was likely very, very, very young. The pulp asymptomatically necrosed and the, and the palatal root never fully developed. And I would imagine that the palatal root never fully developed here either. This practitioner was keen to pick up on it better than I did. Probably made an apical stop and this was their fill. Mine, I I ended up having to backtrack. I ended up having Treat to it. retreat it. This was um, 
a technical nightmare to be very honest, because I, number one, mainly didn't take a comb beam. And number two, I didn't anticipate ever that this would have been a, um, a wide open canal, right? Yeah, we think, oh, like they're an adult patient in our chair, right? Like why would she have an open, a wide open apex? Um, so this was a, a large dose of humble pie that I had to basically um, swallow, clean up and, and really, um, tolerate even though i didn't want yeah. to looking and back then, at that now, and then uh, was is there anything that you you look at that that kind of extra and think oh maybe the easy buckle distal buckle roots are a bit blunted or something like that that you maybe think oh maybe i should have bought it or just code beam and you would have in retro I, I love it i love that question yeah i mean we can even see that this was really open but at the same time this has a lucency so sometimes there is apical resorption that then will kind of deteriorate, right? You, the apic, as a root develops, you should have a constriction. So is it apical resorption or is, is it that they stopped forming? Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of things that I could have picked up on here that, um, that you know, in hindsight is 2020, absolutely. But this was her pre-op. Um, and again, we can spend a lot of time on this and, and we still will, but this was her pre-op that the dentist sent. And then the importance of this share also is that she had a pimple. And whenever you have a pimple, I really would encourage you guys to trace the sinus tract. It can surprise you oftentimes. Yes. Sometimes these sinus tracts will be over here on the mucosa, but it'll actually go to this root. Sometimes the sinus tracts will go to a lateral canal. Sometimes they'll go to a furcation. Sometimes, Sometimes they, you know, when they don't go to an apex or, or even if they do, it, it can be suggestive of something more, either a perio involvement or a fracture or a furcal defect or anything. So I really would encourage practitioners to trace that film, uh, trace that tract and expose it with the film. A few pro tips here since we're going we're to talk about it. So this is usually uh, 20 or 25 got a percha. It doesn't matter the taper. And you're going to tell the patient that it's a little uncomfortable and you're just going to push, push it in as far as it'll go. Sometimes these will curl up on you. That's fine. But what I then do when the gutta percha is in the vestibule is I put a two by two gauze on the gutta percha because, right, like I place it, I walk away, my assistant comes, or even if, if you're taking your own film, you have to go get the sensor, the rin, the comb beam head. And by that time, the patient has like kind of shimmied it out of the okay. sinus tract because they're playing with it, right? It's a little uncomfortable. So always try to place something there so that you know it's staying exactly where you placed it. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Good? Yep. And then what I really wanted you all to look at was something that I also um, barely, barely detected. But if you squint and look closely, there is external invasive cervical root resorption right here along this root. And you can also see it right here as well. And, and thankfully, when I had to do her retreatment, right, because I had to clean up all of this mess that I created, scan. I took a scan, finally, I got smacked some nice. sense into myself, and there was resorption on a lot of her teeth. This wasn't a singular point of resorption. She has resorption on a lot of her teeth. So it was a really eye open. This whole case just continued to humble me over and over and over. Um, so does everyone see that? Yeah, guys, can you say, see that in the comments? Uh, this is why we wanted to do it on YouTube. So they'll let us know. We're in, we're in a delay, so get through this. Yeah, I mean, so this is the kind of resorption that you want to catch. Like this is this is early resorption, right? The few slides ago, that was already well advanced. This is what we can predictably treat. This is what we can 
manage really well is when it's this early. So, so yeah, you, the first line of, um, practitioners, the general dentists, the hygienists that are like squinting at these films, it's there, it's here. It's a lucency that is repeating on numerous films, different angulations, be suspicious. And that's what you want to um, pick up on. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, once you see it like that and you can maybe see it on a, maybe on a bite wing as well, which yes. I think is something very yes. common that, you know, maybe general practitioners take. PAs are a little less common, I think, unless you're someone who's, um, Extremely thorough. Uh, you definitely see those uh, hopefully more more often after seeing this presentation. Thanks. So, the, what is the protocol abroad for uh, for an FMX? In the UK, we're very radiation averse. It it feels like, um, although it's it's kind of left up to you, but you have to be able to justify why you're taking a film so you have to have had a clinical reason to look at something to, to then take them obviously you take a bite the most common thing we take in the uk as a general practitioner would be bite wings every uh on the, on the first patient exam uh first time they come in the door then if they are relatively healthy low risk it's every two years you're not taking lots and lots of pas unless someone's wow. come with some wow. pain or there's a perio. Perio, we're looking at full mouth, uh, a full mouth panel. Um, OPGs are relatively uncommon. They generally tend to be in private practice, which is uh, not the majority of working in. Again, I think I've had this conversation. So certain people saying, "Oh, maybe we should take a an OPG first time the patient comes in the in the door, just to screen and see what's going on." And there's maybe a lot of resistance that way doing that an unnecessary that exposure is that is what's indicated here that's what i see here if if a patient isn't getting an fmx at their new um patient exam they're getting bite wings and an opg a pano yeah so it's it's maybe looked down upon here but for some so mm. but it, it makes sense to me to do that but i guess we have to work within where we are yeah. So here, um, for insurance, right? Insurance dictates a lot of our care, unfortunately. And of course, we have outliers and exceptions, and every practitioner can do do and take whatever is indicated. But insurance will pay for bite wings, I believe, every two years, yeah. and an FMX every five years. So when you think about that here um that might maybe make you guys feel better abroad um and then obviously if a patient is in pain you're you're hopefully taking a pa as needed but i think what i want to share here right is that when you're seeing if you're if you guys are treating a lot of your patients just on bite wings alone so you really need to look at those pulp chambers um, and those larger restorations a little bit more discerning. Yeah, I guess once once a and... crown comes in, you know, we're applying for a crown, then a, then a yeah. PA comes yeah. in. So it's not like we never take them. Okay. But it's more much okay. more targeted Super. to certain Super. Um, situations as opposed to a. Oh, let's have a see. Have a see what's there and work from that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know the how often you guys are abroad is seeing resorption. We're seeing a lot of resorption yeah. here. So, um, you know, obviously we have, I think, become a little bit more curious and a little bit more keen um, to look at films. Um, I take, I take th a 3D scan on about 80% of my patients now for endo. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we were going to come on to that way. And what, what are you starting to do? The, uh, 2D Perfect. versus 3D, I think, a little bit later in the presentation, weren't you? Yes. How am I on time? Well, we're good. Oh, all right. So I think um, just to summarize, we have discussed a lot of these tools. Um, please start playing with them. Um, use them. They're there for a reason. They're supposed to help. I mean, that's why we have this technology, right? Otherwise, we'd still be on um, wet films, right? 
So with Jabber's case really quickly, and then I'll just start to touch on my few uh, uh, 3D um, cases. So this is a lovely endo. It's a it's a really a lovely endo, but you can see how the tools have it's helped so much both of us figure out. I'm Made sorry, it so Jabber? much easier with the with the tools that you've used because I was very much relying on my Apex locator here, wasn't I? Yeah, and you know, to me, what again, we didn't discuss this case really, but this appears to be a young yep. patient. So, Hi. you know, sometimes that apex locator can be a little unreliable with your young patients, especially if you have some vital tissue down in there. It, it just all depends. But yeah, I mean, I can trace this PDL now with my tools and pretty much confidently say, you are right there. Um, you know, this looks amazing. You clearly found MB2. You, you know, you got the pulp porn on this um, distal aspect of this tooth. This is a, a, a great root canal. Um, and you did a great job with this film. So, but you can see here, I relieved it. I clear viewed it. I inverted it again. You can trace the PDL, I believed right here. Um, and again, it, when you re- when you play and continually play, it, it reinforces what you're suspecting, right? If you see it and add all of these tools, then it it, it kind of bolsters your confidence on what you're looking yeah, at. Yeah. And then also dragging the density. So I've talked about radiographic, obviously the clinical exam is super important, but the other huge piece of what I'm doing nowadays is translumination. So, um, you know, getting a light, you can use your hand piece light, you can use a cheap one from Amazon, um, but these small occlusal amalgams, you can appreciate the mesial craze line slash crack. Look, I am transluminating probably 90% of my patients recently. I am using this more and more every day. So we're putting it all together when the patient comes in, in terms of endo. Um, when you see these old amalgams, like there's cracks in them and there's craze lines and there's amalgam leaching, probe this, make sure that this is not progressing. This, look this looks like you're gonna get a probe down in there. The other thing that we do here is biting either with a tooth sleuth or a cotton tipped applicator. Um, electric pulp testing is super valuable if you're not sure. And then sometimes I just blast each tooth, isolating the one before it with um, air. And you want to always duplicate the patient's chief complaint. If I can't do that, I'm not doing work yeah, on them. Yeah. And, then lastly, and then lastly, just like with begging the patient to get that great PA, um, you're listening to them. What is their chief complaint? If they think it's you know a premolar, then it's probably gonna be a premolar. The only time that gets really tricky is on the lowers, which can get really confusing to people's brains Jared. because of the shared inferior, inferior alveolar yeah. nerve. So